Uh, welcome uh, to the question thirst when truthfully, an event where we, we just have uh, questions and answers. Uh, if you're joining this event for the first time, you know that there is no worship time, there's no preaching time, it's just live Q&A straight away. So I'm going to pray and ask God's blessing upon the session. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this time you've given us. Thank you for question thirst quench truthfully. We thank you, Lord, for this monthly event that we have as G4 Mission Baron. Lord, uh, in an imperfect way, uh, Lord, uh, we try to answer questions that people have in their spiritual walk, in their Lord day-to-day -day lives, oh Lord, on various topics. I pray for this session for February 2022. I pray for people who have joined, people who might join down the line. I pray that uh, you will give me wisdom to answer every question that is asked without doing any violence to your word, without contradicting your written word. I pray, Lord, that these answers will bring uh, forth truth from your presence, uh, truth which will set people free. Lord, uh, we thank you for Prophet Hosea who recorded, my people perish because of lack of knowledge. And I pray that, uh, Lord, everyone who attends this session, Lord, will not have lack of knowledge on any subject under the sun, uh, Lord, because your word has answers for all our questions, oh Lord. We thank you. We give you all the glory. We ask all this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Welcome, and you can start uh, to shoot. Uh, there are two ways you can answer que ask questions. You can either unmute yourself and ask me a question via audio, or you can send it via chat, uh, and you can also choose to uh, send it via private chat. So when you send it via private chat, I won't even take your name, and I will simply ask uh, the question. So we right now we have uh, seven participants, so uh, most welcome to everyone. Uh, okay, you can start shooting. Uh, if you have a question, please ask, unmute yourself and ask via audio, or you can uh, type the question via chat. Uh, both are okay with me. Okay, who's going to go first? Yes. I'm just also watching my chat here. All right. I hope you all, you all can hear me, right? Yes. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Awesome. Yeah, you can shoot, ask a question. Go ahead. So don't hesitate. It could be on a Bible passage. It could be on a uh, ethical issue. It could be on related to your spiritual life. Could be on uh, youth issues. Uh, okay. All right. Here's a question via chat. Uh, can you explain First Kings 13, 11 to 31? Okay. One moment. Let me turn my Bible to the book of First Kings. Uh, First Kings chapter 13 and 11 to 31. First Kings 13, 11 to 31. Okay, this is a story actually. So uh, I'd love to preach on the story. In fact, I have preached on the story. If you go to YouTube and search uh, uh, Duke Jeraj, uh, Old Prophet, or Duke Jeraj, First Corinthians 13, there will be a message that comes from there. Uh, is there anything particularly? Okay, why? Okay, that's the question. Okay, why uh, did the prophet of First Corinthians 13, the prophet have to lie? Okay. Uh, let's uh, read the relevant portion here and, the, and from there we will find the answer. Okay. Uh, let me start. Okay. Verse 11. Uh, now there was an old prophet living in Bethel whose name the sons came and told him all that the man of God had, 
had done there that day. They also told the father what he had said to the king. The father asked them, which way did he go? And the son showed him which way the man of God had, had taken. So he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. And when they saddled the donkey for him, he mounted it and rode after the man of God. He found him sitting under an oak tree and asked, are you the man of God who came from Judah? He said, I am. So the prophet said to him, come home with me and eat. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. I've been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there uh, or return by the way you came. The old prophet said, I too am a prophet as you are. An angel of the Lord said to me by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. Okay, that's the question. Okay, uh, that's First Corinthians, sorry, First Kings chapter 13 and verse 18. That's your question. So why did the prophet have to lie? So the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in his house. A simple answer. Uh, you know, for this is, uh, you know, you, you tend to have highs and lows in your spiritual life. It's not that uh, you necessarily have to sin after a high, but, uh, but that's the case. In fact, we have that throughout the Bible. We have Abraham who was speaking white lies. We have David who committed adultery. And uh, we had Paul in the New Testament after Jesus went to the cross, after Jesus rose again, after Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, after Paul accepted Jesus. There was a time when he looked at uh, a religious leader and said, you whitewashed wall. And then uh, if you read the Eugene Peterson version of that edition, he says, I'm sorry. Uh, Paul apologizes. I'm sorry. Uh, that's there in the book of Acts and so on and so forth. So uh, the, a lie is a lie. Uh, even if a prophet says it, it's a lie. So the simple answer is uh, every man of God has his highs and lows. Uh, so a, a man of God, a woman of God, uh, a Christian leader is not beyond sin. So sin can come and attack you anytime. So uh, that, is a, that, that is a simplistic answer. But if you want some good Bible teaching on this story, uh, in fact, I shared the story uh, with students of a Bible college you can check that out on my YouTube. Um, uh, just have to search Duke Jeraj, First Kings 13, uh, Duke Jeraj, Old Prophet uh, and uh, Story, and, and you would uh, get a good, solid message. And maybe there I would have even talked about more reasons as to why the Old Prophet lied. All right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, happy to have uh, my friend Sherry Rao, Sherry Roy. Uh, we have Jebestein, uh, we have Anantaraj, uh, some people's names are not, we have Irene, we have Jensi, uh, we have uh, people joining, okay. All right, uh, here's another direct, uh, another anonymous question that's coming here. Uh, hello, sir, a person who lived his entire life as a child of God, uh, walked in the way of God and he was a person who's led many people to Christ. He passed away in his middle age. Everyone thinks he's in heaven and says he's watching day, watching everything. <coughs> Who is this? Does he see us from heaven? Okay. Uh, well, uh, your question is if some, a man of God who dies, uh, is it true that he's watching us from heaven? Now, Nobody can be 100% sure of uh, these things, but these are things that you tend to hear. Uh, uh, people say these things to comfort the buried family a lot, uh, uh, but uh, we can't be 100% sure. Uh, you know, if I was in the, in the same position, uh, I would say, I, I would insert the word, I believe, He's watching us from heaven because uh, in life in heaven, uh, the Bible does give us some detail, but not too much detail. Uh, because if the Bible gives too much detail about life in heaven, then going to heaven uh, will not be that exciting. So there's always uh, an, uh, a 
an element of uh, surprise about uh, life in heaven. There's a place where the Bible says, uh, uh, I has not seen, okay, I can, I can find that out. I has not, I has not seen, okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So we do not know for sure. See, the Bible teaches that God sees everything, God knows everything, uh, but the Bible is not very specific about whether uh, we will get all of that uh, knowledge uh, without any reservation. Uh, the Bible is not clear, but there is a verse which uh, people sort of rely on when they make such claims like this son, this loved one who passed away, who went to heaven is watching us from heaven. And that is, that's also come, that, that comes from Corinthians. Okay. Uh, that comes from first Corinthians uh, uh, chapter uh, 13 and verse 12, first Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12. It says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. So that, Words that verse first Corinthians 13 12 okay. seems to say that what we did not know oh. here on earth, uh, our imperfection and so knowledge, uh, those that knowledge will be made perfect in heaven. Uh, so, in a sense, our knowledge we become we, we have access to a lot more knowledge uh, than we had knowledge when we are we're on earth when we cross over to eternity and go to heaven so in that sense people in heaven do know a lot of things but whether we live whether they literally watch everything happening uh, i'm not very sure the bible doesn't uh, clearly specify that uh, so but that need not be a major obsession for us because these are things that the bible does not major on uh, and of course if you come to the end of the book of revelation there are more things about heaven that the Bible talks about, I recommend that you read a book uh, by J. David Pawson. Uh, David Pawson is a, a very good Bible teacher and he wrote a book called The Road to Hell. J. David Pawson, Pawson spelled as P-A-W-S-O-N, The Road to Hell. And there's a chapter on heaven and uh, he describes different things uh, about heaven in the light of the Bible. So uh, that would give you a further understanding about what exactly goes on in the light in life uh, in heaven uh, for example one thing david pawson uh, said the other day i was traveling to uh, Wellore from chennai and i was listening to his one of his messages his entire message uh, 90 uh, minute message and there he said in in heaven there is no marriage for and i know i'm digressing because we'll all be like angels and uh, that that story comes in the gospels so there's no marriage so we don't we would not be, if we are married here in heaven, uh, we won't have the same kind of married relationship in heaven. And in that sense, there is no sex in heaven, but he also humorously says, we won't miss it and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of questions about heaven. Uh, many things will become clear when we actually cross over uh, to heaven and start living there. Okay. Thank you for the question. And these questions are coming quick and fast today. Uh, no starting trouble for our participants. Excellent. Okay. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. I know some of you have sent it by WhatsApp. Uh, well, I just am rushing in. I'm, I don't have my phone with me right now. If you don't mind, if you can post it as a direct message for me, if you have already was, asked me a question by WhatsApp, uh, I would appreciate that. Uh, uh, or I need to get up and pick up my phone. Uh, so that'll be uh, that'll be useful. Okay. Anybody? Any audio question? Anybody wants to unmute yourself and and uh, ask a question? You're most welcome. And this is question thirst quench truthfully. For one hour, fifteen minutes of just uh, Q and A. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, here is a question with regard to uh, tights, which I would uh, take up. Uh, should giving towards the work of God today be called tithes and offerings. Okay. That's question number one. And question number two, what should 
tithes be used for according to the Bible? All right. Very good question. And thank you for asking these, uh, these very relevant questions. Now, uh, when it comes to tithes, okay, we need to uh, see the entire teaching of the Bible. Because if we don't see the entire teaching of the Bible, we will miss a point. Okay, there is the, the, the direct question is, does the New Testament speak about tithes? Okay, that's, that's the biggest, that's the direct, the, the most obvious question uh, that we need to ask. Okay, so Jesus mentions tithes once when he's speaking to the scribes and Pharisees, and he's, in, he's going on a, on a tirade against them. He's going, he's going after them. He's very upset with them. So when he's upset with them, he mentions tithes, uh as he as he as he talks to them as he rebukes them uh, in matthew 23 and verse 23 he says woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you pay tithe of the mint and anise and cumin and have neglected weightier matters of the law justice mercy and faith these you ought to have done without leaving the others so He's mentioning, he, he's actually telling the, the, Pharise, the Pharisees that they, they should have not only tithe, but they should have also not neglected the weightier matters of the law, which is uh, justice, mercy, and faith. In fact, this has also been the teaching of the Old Testament. If you see uh, Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, uh, for example, and that is just one verse, uh, the Bible always placed a premium on uh, when, it come, when it comes to uh, things that we have to do, uh, ritual, ritualistic things versus uh, the other things which are moral issues. The Bible placed the moral issue on a higher ground rather than the ritualistic things. The ritualistic things are reminding us of a greater reality and the greater reality all those rituals all those sacrifices all those things were pointing to a to a, to a person uh, and 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 that is jesus they were shadows of jesus in some way okay i don't have time to tell you uh, in in what way but we all know that the ritualistic things of the old testament in, and every law in a in a in a direct in an indirect way were pointing us to the work of jesus on the cross of calvary so Micah 6, 8, and there are verses like that on literally every uh, prophetic book as you study, okay? But except that statement that Jesus made about tithes in the New Testament, no other Bible author talks about tithes. And as if you would have often heard me say this, and I say it again, uh, our call as New Testament believers is to follow Jesus the way apostles follow Jesus. And that is why five times in the Bible, Apostle Paul says, in, a, in effect, he says, he, he says that directly, but he also says that using different words. Five times, at least five times. It could be even more. Follow me as I follow Christ, which means we, our call is we must call, follow Jesus the way apostles follow Jesus. Because uh, Jesus' words can be interpreted in various ways, but God gave the Holy Spirit to the apostles to understand the words of Jesus and apply it in the local church. And none of the apostles actually talked about tithes. So if there's a question whether giving towards the work of God today be called tithes and offerings, I would say no. If you do not, if you want to follow the way of Christ and the apostles, no, that would be my direct answer. But having said that, the New Testament talks a lot about giving. So uh, generally, questions about tithes uh, are asked uh, by people uh, who, uh, this is not, I'm not talking about the person who asked the question because I know the person personally and uh, I know that that person gives to the local church and also gives to other ministries uh, over and above what he or she gives to the local church. So I know the person who asked the question. Uh, 
But generally, people who ask questions about tithes are those who don't want to give to the local church. But if you're going to look for any statement from Duke Jairaj, which will sort of suggest that you don't have to give to your local church, uh, you will be disappointed. Because I want to tell you, forget about me, you would find a lot of encouragement in the Bible for you to sacrificially give to the local church. Okay. And you must, and we must. Why? Uh, God has designed things for us, designed it beautifully that we receive a lot of spiritual food from our local church. And if you read uh, Corinthians, and if you read uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, okay, 1 Corinthians 9, okay, for example, 1 Corinthians 9, 7, whoever goes to war at his, at his own expense. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Or who tends a flock? Okay, flock. Uh, so here, the last sentence, Paul introduces himself as a, as a pastor. Who tends a flock? Flock, the church. Okay, he's talking about the church and he's a pastor. And does not drink of the milk of the flock. Which means the pastors who feed you the word of God, you know, you need to support them. And uh, and especially when uh, they are teaching you sound doctrine, they're giving you a balanced diet of scripture and, and so on and so forth. So we must support. In fact, there is a, uh, there's also a command uh, which, uh, which tells that, that every New Testament believer must give to the church on the first day of the week. Uh, when you gather, let me see whether I can pick that up. Okay. Okay. First Corinthians 16 and verse 2. First Corinthians 16 and verse 2. Perhaps one of the strongest statements in the New Testament concerning giving to the local church. First Corinthians 16 and verse 2. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as them as he may prosper that there will be no collections when I come. So here, okay, I'm also answering part of the question two. So while I say that there's nothing in the New Testament that tells us that we must be tithing, and but the but there is there is a statement in the New Testament. So tithing is something you know the understanding is we do it once a month, okay. But this is this is even more greater than tithing. Here it says every week. On the first day of the week, when you gather as a local church, on the first day of the week, let, let each one of you lay something aside. And when you read Corinthians uh, the, uh, chapter 9 and uh, other places, uh, so there's a great encouragement to give sacrificially. The percentages are given, but sacrificial, sacrificial giving. Every week, storing up as he may prosper, so there will be no collections when I come. So when Paul came to the church at Corinth, he was collecting something which he was actually carrying away for, the, for, the, for, the, for a particular cause. And we know that cause uh, was to help the poor believers who were hit by you know, something terrible, uh, a famine in Jerusalem. So he was collecting it. So the, 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 the offerings that you give in church goes to the work of the gospel, work of, work of God. And so uh, that, is, that, is, uh, that is my uh, answer. Well, Jesus, uh, another thing that Jesus, uh, another thing about Jesus when it comes to, when we need to remember when Jesus was talking about giving, he talked about the, the, the poor widow who gave two coins, okay, the, uh, and Jesus underlined the fact that she gave her all. So a respected Bible teacher remarked like this. So the New Testament is not talking about tithes. The New Testament is talking about total. That means, in fact, all of our resources, all of our time, all of our treasures, all of our talents goes to the work of God. It's not just, time thing is not just one dimensional. So you give your time, Okay, in fact, I think it's not even there, but the New Testament is not giving 10% of anything, but giving your total. So it's not just that you use 
give 10% to God and 90% you, you know, you can use as subscription to por pornographic channels and uh, or 90% you give for uh, uh, to bribe a government. No, no, doesn't work like that. The hundred percent of it you you use to build God's kingdom, to encourage the work of the gospel, and to to facilitate the the reaching of the lost. Uh, see, in fact, um, as a ministry, we just completed sixteen years. Uh, G formation began in the uh, in the year two thousand six when I sent an email on February sixteenth at around nine thirty in the morning, and at that time I was working in a call center, uh, uh, but shortly. You know, in response to the vision I cast in that email that the grabbing uh, that we will be a ministry that grabs the Google generation from going to Gehenna. Gehenna is the word that Jesus used for hell, you know, and we'll teach God's word. We would go out and give tracts. Uh, we'll go to the highways and byways and give tracts and we'll produce literature. We'll teach, uh, we'll preach God's word. You know, when, when I cast the vision and I cast the action, you know, people started to sow in our ministry. The, the, the response was so overwhelming. Within a short time, in 2008, this, I sent this email in 2006, 2008, I quit and I became full-time with my own ministry. And I've been full-time with G4 Mission ever since. Uh, I used to, the last organization I worked was HSBC, Global Resourcing. So in, what I'm saying is, uh, you know, as the spirit of God motivates the people of God, they can give, okay, to the local church, because from that's where you receive your, uh, your uh, uh, main spiritual food. But beyond that as the spirit of god burdens people over and about that to para church organizations it could be to any ministry that god burdens you you can actually give you can give so that that ministry will be supported and through that ministry you know uh, hell will be plundered and heaven will be populated so that's my response. In fact, again, there are some other response questions about tithes I've answered. You go to uh, YouTube, Duke Gerard tithes, and those uh, uh, answers will be there. Uh, maybe some things I missed in this answer you'd find there. All right. So uh, thank you very much. I hope. And I, in fact, tithing itself is a huge topic, controversial topic. So the, the bottom line is you must give sacrificially to your local church because you receive a, a spiritual food there but over and beyond the local church uh, should the lord burden you for about other ministries uh, you should go ahead and give and that money should be used for the work of the gospel okay and uh and the bible also says if you read first corinthians 9 that the bible does not ban the man of God or the, the, the worker of the gospel from using some of the, the, the funds that he, not all, the some of the funds that he, you, that he gets for his own personal needs as well. And so uh, that, that is also, that if you read 1 Corinthians 9, you see that. Not for the greed, but for the need of the servants of God. Not, for, not to facilitate his greed, but his need. You know, that those funds can be used. In our ministry, you know, uh, we, uh, Ivan and I uh, have a, a, a something like a, 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 a salary which is in line with the general salary of uh, servants of God uh, who do a similar kind of work. And, and the actual ministry expenses are taken from uh, those funds. Uh, in fact, I learned that from Billy Graham. If you read his autobiography, Just As I Am, he talks about how he set his standard of living, a salary in line with an uh, average size church of a city. Because at one point in time, Billy Graham became embarrassed, that's the word he used, by the amount of offering that he got. So he felt that he, his standard should not be lower than the, the city average pastor's uh, standard of living, nor higher. So uh, so he, he did that. And of course, we have a board as well. And uh, uh, with non-relatives in it, and we submit accounts to the government of India, and so on and so forth. So we must uh, be accountable not only to God but also to people. Not only to God but also Gad, Prophet Gad, G A D. Uh, there was a prophet called Gad in the Bible. So it's, this is a massive topic. Uh, I, I will not be able to do full justice to it uh, in this uh, ten or fifteen minutes. Okay, another direct question. A lot of questions pouring in. Okay, I want to answer as many as possible. Okay, oops, let me, 
Okay, is it necessary to get married? What if we live a single life, uh, but not illegal relations? Is this kind of life acceptable with God according to the Bible? There is, there, there are uh, clear passages in the Bible that tells us it could be God's call to you that you be single. Let me see if I can pull up that verse uh, quickly. Uh, I think it's in Matthew chapter 7, 19. Jesus talked about it, okay? Uh, Jesus teaches on celibacy. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 11, okay? Uh, but he said to them, Matthew 19 and verse 11, but he said to them, all cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who have been born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who are made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have been made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. Okay, he was able to accept it, let him accept it. So in Matthew 19, 11, 12, Jesus says there are people who choose not to get married. Okay, for, for the kingdom's sake, for the kingdom of God's sake. So you, you can do that. In fact, uh, elsewhere, if you read Apostle Paul's writings, and I think that comes in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter, seven, uh, first chapter 7, if you read, uh, you know, Paul says a married man's concern would be to uh, would be to to look into the interests of his wife. Okay, a married man's concern would be, uh, and rightly so, you need to be concerned about your immediate family. If you don't provide for the needs of your immediate family, you are worse than an unbeliever. Paul says elsewhere, so that's important. But God can choose to lead you not to get married, so that you can. Use all your time for the kingdom of God work, as we read in um, Matthew 19, 12, and uh, elsewhere as well. So that's a, a pretty simple answer for me to give. Okay, so it's not necessary to get married. Okay, but there are some denominations, if you want to be ordained uh, by them, if you want to be, if you want to reach the highest level of ministry in them, they insist that you should get married. But I think that, uh, that they do because of some considerations which are uh, you know which are uh, okay but not strictly from uh, Bible so those laws they are called church laws not necessarily biblical laws but church administration laws but strictly from the biblical point of view there, uh, there is no uh, there is no compulsion for anyone to get married okay uh, well we do read uh, I know it is not good for a man to be alone. But there are exceptions as well, as we see in Matthew 19, 20. Generally speaking, it is not good for a man to be alone. It's good to be married. And, uh, and I've talked about five reasons why God created marriage. It's there in my book, Straight Talk. Uh, they are MCs, okay, MCs, uh, meaningful conversation, magical climax, um, uh, making of children, molding of character, merge Christ if reflection with scriptures for each point. It's there in my book, Straight Talk, is one of the chapters. But at the same time, uh, God can lead you to a single life. And as a single person, you can effectively build God's kingdom. In fact, they say that Daniel did not get married. They say Paul did not get married. So we have an example in the Old Testament, example in the New Testament. Uh, so uh, no problem. Uh, nothing unbiblical. Okay. Okay. Second question. Owing to a lack of time to a busy life, we club prayer with day-to-day -day activities like exercising, praying, for example. Is it wrong if we don't give special time to God as for the Bible? Okay. Uh, another, another good question. So instead of uh, having a prayer time, exclusive prayer time where I kneel down and pray. Can I just uh, do some floor exercise and pray? You can, you certainly can. But at the same time, I would say it, uh, you, you need to give exclusive time for prayer. Uh, you need to prioritize God as number one. So I know some of us would like to combine walking with it. So, uh, you know, you, you can do that now and then, but but if you don't have the habit of kneeling before God's presence, if you don't have the habit of, 
of opening your Bible and reading, underlining, writing down. And your only habit is to read the Bible via YouTube, uh, audio of YouTube, uh, watch the Bible, uh, hear, hear the Bible being read via YouTube audio. Then uh, that there's something wrong. You need to give time. Uh, you need to wait in God's presence. Uh, you need to wait in God's presence and and, and, and don't forget the old fashioned ways where you go alone. Uh, you don't have to look too, too far away to get inspiration to do this. Our Lord Jesus himself is a, is a great example. In, in, Matthew, in Matthew chapter, Mark chapter one, verses 34 and 35. Mark chapter one, 34 and 35. Okay. We read this about our Lord Jesus. Mark 1, 34 and 35. Okay, uh, 35. Very early in the morning, when it was still dark, Jesus got up, went off to a lonely place where he prayed. In fact, I tried to memorize the scripture. Easy to memorize than to practice. So which means the first thing that Jesus did during his day as an example for us is to rise up and spend time in his presence. Our generation, the first thing we do is to reach for the cell phone. That is so anti-Jesus-like. That is, you know, the, if we pick up the cell phone, the first thing in the morning, we become an antichrist. Because the first thing that Jesus did as he got up is to want to spend focused time with his father. He went up to a lonely place, which means didn't want any other distractions. So when you walk and exercise, you do have to concentrate on whether you do your exercise right and, and so on and so forth. Okay, whether you're doing it right, well, what is the next exercise? Okay, you, you probably having a, you have a cycle for your floor exercise. Now, what through the example of Jesus, okay, this is not the only time the Bible talks about the devotional life of Jesus. You know, the Bible teaches us in our, in our lifelong, in the lifelong process of us becoming more like Jesus. We, we need to spend focused time on Bible reading and prayer. And there is no way we can uh, sort, of, uh, sort of merge it with other activities. Like, uh, yes, you can cook and, pr uh, and pray. You can wash vessels and pray. And you'd read about a great man of God who did that as he washed vessels the practice of the presence of God and so on and so forth. So those are supplementary. Those are additional. Those are extra ways, but that they cannot take your, take away the primary time that we spend in God's presence. Uh, and that is, that is, that is necessary for us to take root in Jesus. Book of Colossians talks about it. Uh, uh, put our roots in Jesus and grow. And we keep growing till we, become more and more and more like Jesus. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to slot in as, 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 as many questions as possible. Uh, praise the Lord. Pastor is not the present generation, the fig tree as described as in Matthew 24, 32 to 34. Uh, okay. Now this is a very interesting question. According to Matthew 24, 32, 34, this present generation is seen as a is, is it the is it the is it a fig tree is it a fig tree uh well only time will tell only time will tell why why do i say time will tell we need to have the return of jesus we need to have the final day of judgment we need to have uh, jesus uh, we need to hear what jesus says in the final day of judgment for us to understand that so be very skeptical of any preacher who says, this is what you see. This is the last day sign you see in the Bible. Uh, he's maybe right, maybe not right. And anything that sort of says that, okay, Jesus is going to come on this day or even this week or this, this generation, we can't even have teaching that says Jesus has to come in this generation because that is also fixing a date for Jesus' return, which the Bible has clearly, that as plain as black and white directly, the Bible says 
that should not be done. So don't even try it. So, so no preacher has the right to say that this generation, before this generation ends, Jesus will have to come. Jesus, all we have only permission to say, we are close to the return of Jesus. And then there's a classic verse, as we say, uh, one, uh, one day in the, according to the Father, uh, according to God, is, e is equal to a thousand years. Okay, let me pull up the scripture. That's there in Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Beloved, do not forget this one thing with the Lord. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So Jesus' delay, second coming can be delayed by even a thousand years or even beyond, or it can happen before I finish this Zoom meeting. So that's all we have authority to say. So you can't pull up some in event that took place in uh, in in Europe or uh, uh, you know some somebody you read a news article about some chip being implanted uh, into people's uh, uh, veins or wherever, and and people uh, do it, uh, had to as part of the banking uh, technology improvement and so on and so forth, and say okay. Jesus is going to come before the end of it. No, there, there's no biblical warrant for that because it's clear. We cannot predict when Jesus will come. And that includes the, the statement uh, that, uh, you know, that includes the understanding that we cannot say that Jesus has to necessarily come in this generation. Can he come? Yes, he, he can come before I finish the sentence. But we don't know. He's like a thief who will come. And no thief announces when he's going to come. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Oops, okay. I have grown up in a negative environment. Let me take a breather now. And because of that, I've developed a very rude sort of attitude. I don't have friends. I feel that I'm a misfit. Uh, please guide me. Okay. Uh, I, I, feel, I, I feel for you that you've grown up in a an environment that was not particularly uh, friendly. Uh, it, the, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that you grew up in an environment, environment where people did not love you and, and cherish you. And however imperfect, however imperfectly, there's something which I try to do for my family. Uh, right now, my wife and my daughter, uh, my son far away uh, in college, uh, you know, I try to be that loving dad, a loving husband. I, I, I plant that kiss and I give a shoulder squeeze and, because I want them to know that I love them and I'm there for them. Uh, if you didn't grow up in an atmosphere like that, I feel for it. I feel for it. Okay. Uh, okay, let me. And now, as a reaction, you say, I've become a rude sort of person. Now, one thing that you are allowing to happen is you're you're allowing the circumstances of your life to dictate what you should do but may i tell you my dear friend okay may i tell you that this book which i hold in my hand one of the main things that it teaches us is we don't allow our circumstances to tell us what to do but we allow what God, we allow God to dictate what we should do. And that is there throughout. In fact, uh, I can take you to one classic passage, which uh, you all know, but you don't, you may not think about it on a situation like this, when we're trying to answer this question. And that's from Habakkuk chapter three, uh, Habakkuk chapter three. Okay, it says in verses uh, 17, Habakkuk 3, 17, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the trees yield no food, though the flocks may not, may be cut off from the fold and there'll be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will joy in the God of my salvation. So which means there and not just there, but elsewhere, the Bible repeatedly says, 
we don't allow our circumstances to decide what we what we want to do naturally you know if you just want to go by the natural way yes you can be a rude person because you've been people have been unkind to you all through your life but you know but jesus when you come to him gives you a happiness a, a happiness that does not depend on happenings so your reaction can be different in fact one of the grandest things that the holy spirit does you know there is a, and oftentimes i'm in youth camps and i'm preaching to young people and if i preach get to preach seven or eight messages to young people at a stretch in a youth camp that i'm definitely going to preach to them about the holy spirit and i there's a message which i proclaim with great passion and uh, because that message has impacted my own life and that is what the holy spirit can do do in your life he is a good ghost the holy spirit is a good ghost he fills your life with great goodness and one thing that the holy spirit can do in your life if only you will give him space in your life if you only give him lordship in your life if only you will allow him to fill you in your life is the holy spirit gives you love for the unlovely he pours out pours god's love in your heart let me pull up that scripture there he pours he pours god's love in your heart the holy spirit love for the unlovely romans chapter 5 verse 5 romans chapter 5 god's love has been poured in our hearts through the holy spirit so because god's love is in operation in your life through the holy spirit you can learn not to be rude though in the natural sense every nerve screams that you should be rude in the natural sense everything in your body says everything in your system says i must be rude but when the holy spirit comes in you can actually be kind you can be patient you can be gentle because those are his gifts and as we understand from galatians chapter 5 uh in fact uh those are his, those are those are his fruit singular not fruits singular okay uh, because all are important so gifts there are people servants of god one servant of god one believer not just servants of god a believer will have one gift but not have the other gift but with the fruit it is compulsory that we have all the fruit it's not fruits it's fruit one fruit with different flavors what are the different flavors we understand that from galatians chapter 5 okay uh it says galatians 5 uh love 522 love joy peace patience kindness 522 galatians 522 it comes to the fruit of the spirit not plural fruits so you, you can't pick and choose okay i like pomegranate but i don't like grapes uh, i like grapes but i don't like apple you don't pick and choose like that you have all all fruits are compulsory all fruit is compulsory okay let me correct myself the fruit of the spirit singular 522 love joy peace patience kindness gentleness faithfulness okay goodness sorry faithfulness gentleness self control so to the holy spirit there is no shortcut allow the holy spirit to take control of your life and he will give you a joy that doesn't depend on happenings okay and then when you start to do that Uh, you will get a remnant to be surround you not a big crowd because when you follow jesus you will go on that narrow road that jesus talked about in matthew chapter 7 that narrow road you will not be popular you will not be uh, uh, you will not win popularity contest if contests if you truly follow jesus because it's a narrow road only a remnant will be with you uh, at, sometimes you have to walk the path alone it's worth it it's worth it even if you go alone or even if just there's just one person or few people with you okay uh when jesus finished his mission and uh and when he died on the cross when it said when he said it's finished there's only one fellow standing next to him john all the rest were left him john only one person with his team and he, as he ended his ministry uh, as he, as he, as he as he said it's finished john was there and then a few ladies were there okay all the rest left him 
So you don't, you don't have to necessarily, and if you, if that's the case with Jesus, uh, uh, so it will be your case as you follow him. So uh, you, you, you may not be popular. In fact, Galatians 1.10 talks directly about this, these things. So we may not have too many friends, but God will give us, give us friends to encourage us. Uh, I, that's been my experience. But even if you have to walk in alone, he will give you the grace. That's what I'm saying. Because you have the Holy Spirit. You have God with you. God will be your friend. He will be a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. Am I trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I was trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So it's my prayer that God would give you at least a few to encourage. But even otherwise, don't worry. Uh, you know, when you have the Holy Spirit, when you have his presence and when you produce the fruit, uh, God, you know, you have a joy that doesn't depend on situations around. Okay. Let me. Have a sip of water. I appreciate uh, people staying back and listening to all these answers. Okay. Let me have a look at the time. It says 9.53, so we will finish exactly at 10.15. Uh, what's the Bible take, biblical take on suicides? Even in the Bible, there are recorded suicides of namely King Saul, Ahitophel, King Zimri, and Judas Iscariot. Okay. Uh, so if your question is, uh, can a person commit suicide and still come to heaven? Uh, while uh, I would... Uh, uh, you know, if you're going to ask me, okay, so-and-so committed suicide. So is he coming to heaven or hell? So see, I would, I would not be in a position to answer that, but I can safely tell you that if a person has committed suicide and that person has not repented, okay. Uh, for example, uh, he instantly died and he committed suicide, believing suicide was not a sin, uh, I believe in the light of the teaching that we have that comes in the category of unrepented of sins. Okay. And the category of unrepented of sins is very dangerous. Uh, Romans uh, chapter two. And uh, let's read Romans chapter two, verses four and five. It's a very, uh, it's a, it's a verse in Romans, but not very popular, but I, I do my best to make it popular because I refer to this often. Romans 2, 4. Do you think lightly of the riches of this kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing the kindness of God leads you to repentance? See, there is there is enough teaching in the Bible that says, okay, it's there. The Old Testament in Ecclesiastes that God has put eternity in your hearts. Uh, so God has put eternity in our, in our hearts. That means we have, we have a beginning. God didn't have a beginning, but we have a beginning. But God actually put eternity in our hearts, which means though we will have nat though we would die one day, we are not authorized to take our own life because the author of life has already determined how long we're going to live. Uh, Psalm 139, he's got a plan for each day of our life. And one plan is definitely not that we should take our own life. We should live it till, you know, we die in the natural way or Maybe disease takes us or somebody murders us. We go preach the gospel. We, we, are, we, we, are, we are killed for the sake of the gospel. Jim Elliott, example. John Allen Chaub, example, and so on and so forth. But taking our own life, that's not permissible because that is trying to rebel against God's plan for your life. God may plan that you live till, uh, till 90 or 95 or 105. I don't know how long. So... That, that is clearly wrong. So it's, but if you still take your life, it is like taking the grace of God for granted. So what is in store for those who take God's grace for granted? Verse five, Romans chapter two, verse five. But because of your stubbornness, Romans two, verse five, and unrepented heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of unrighteous judgment of God. So those who stubbornly die believing that they can get, they, they, they can outsmart God with suicide. Suicide is not a sin. They will go straight to hell and burn then forever and forever. It's a 
dangerous proposition that the same is true of any other sin porn watching or pride or envy or jealousy or uh, you know any other sin so uh, th this is a so there's, there's nothing in the Bible that tells us that, okay, you can remain in sin and God will, and die and God will receive you into heaven. Absolutely not. God is looking for, God's calling us to repent of sin. God is calling us to have short accounts with him. So if there's, if the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, repent of that. So definitely the Holy Spirit is not going to speak to anybody to, uh, to walk down the path of suicide. And all these cases that you have mentioned, King Saul, in fact, I've written an article about people who committed suicide. It could be in my uh, webs, in my uh, blog called dukewords.com, D-U-K-E-W-O-R-D-S.com. You can go there. If there's a search bar there, you can search for an article on suicide or you can reach out to me on WhatsApp. So all these cases find are, are fascinating examples of what you can actually have in your life. And if you are depending on that, which you sort of searched for in your life, that when you have that, even after you have that, you'll still end up, you know, uh, having suicidal thoughts, and then you could take up, take your life. Uh, uh, king Saul became the king of his land, but that position could not fulfill the the this the vacuum in, your, in his heart. Okay, Ahitophel had a government job. He was. He was employed in the palace, but one day when, his, when he had a professional failure, he took his life. So you think if I will only go to USA, if I will only go to Dubai, if only I'll go to that country, get this job, this job will give me peace. Then you are a suicide candidate, possible suicide candidate one day because you're placing the trust in the wrong thing. So to learn those kind of lessons, those stories are important, but none of those stories will actually inspire any one of us to take suicide or tell any of us to commit suicide because committing suicide is a sin against God. All right, uh, uh, Judas Iscariot thought money could give him that thing that he missed in his life, but then money cannot give you what is missing in your heart. A relationship, a living daily relationship with Jesus who said, I have come to give you life, life to the full, John 10, 10. A relationship with Jesus will give you purpose and meaning in life. So if you try everything else, you will become a suicide, a person with suicidal tendencies. Okay, that's the message. Okay, thank you for your responses. I appreciate uh, uh, you staying in this. Uh, uh, I have a response here. Thank you, Anna. Th that helps. God bless. Uh, this is in response to my uh, my answer for the question on tides. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I understand some of you have to leave as well. Uh, uh, that is okay. Uh, uh, praise the Lord. Pastor, how to start a gospel ministry as a beginner if that person is working as an employee? Okay. You said that you gave tracts to many people in various places and shared God's word. Please give some suggestions. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, Thank you for asking this uh, question. See, I want you to understand that uh, you don't need to see a vision from heaven. Uh, you don't need to see something in a dream. You don't need to have an angel appear before you to st start to do ministry. All you need to do is, all you need to uh, uh, know is, when you read the Bible, you understand that every born again believer, every person who knows Jesus as Savior, is supposed to get involved in ministry. The Bible teaches what is called as priesthood of all believers. What is priesthood of all, all believers? That comes from 1 Peter chapter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Okay, that doctrine is called priesthood of all believers. Not just your pastor, not just the mega church pastor, not just the superstar evangelist, but every believer, every believer must get involved in ministry. That's the teaching of the New Testament. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. He's talking to every church believer, every church believer, that you may declare, verse 1 Peter 2, 9, second part, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the wondrous light. So, you know, my parents worked in an organization called Blessing Youth Mission, BYM, as it was called. 
uh, FGYMA uh, in the early 70s, and then later it became Blessing Youth Mission. My parents were, uh, worked there and retired. Uh, my wife's parents also worked there. And one of the teachings of this organization, um, not their own teaching, it's there in the Bible, is to rub this in. And I grew up hearing all that. So at the age of 11, I accepted Jesus. Uh, when I went to a CSI church uh, close to my home, hometown, Velour, I went to Rani Pet in a CSI church. In a meeting organized by Blessing Youth Mission, I accepted Jesus, Lord and Savior. At the age of 13, I went to a camp in Danish Pet in central Tamil Nadu, and I heard and the BYM uh, leaders preach. And then I, at the end of that meeting, you know, I had a, I was given a burden to do something for Jesus. At the age of 13, I came back to Wellore. Okay. I live in an area called Church Colony, not very far from the Alcott CSI Memorial Church. So I gathered up a few boys in my locality. And what I understood from the Bible, because I understood the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. And from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, I understood it. And what I had learned in my daily devotion, I taught the few boys who came and gathered under the tree in the old Alcord Memorial Church in Velour. I taught. And then we would take cycles and we would cycle towards Velour, okay, uh, near the a fort where there was an old bus stand. We gave tracks. Uh, tracks near the fort area in Velour and uh, tracks near the bus stand area. Uh, we used the track called Blessing for You, again published by Blessing You Mission. Uh, and I, that's how we started. And then when I joined college, I, I got, I was a late admission into an agriculture college and I did engineering. I did agriculture engineering. Uh, during the train journey, I gave tracks during the train. You know, there was a, there were some people from my own college in the, traveling the same train, Chennai all the way to uh, Varanasi. And then we got off at Allahabad. It was a 36 hour journey, Chennai to Varanasi. Okay, in that train journey, I would give tracks and some of my friends traveling the same train, okay, uh, they did not, uh, you know, they were not believers and they would get drunk in the journey. And they've, they've seen me cross them and give tracks. Later on, God moved one of their hearts to become one of our long-standing missionaries ministry supporters because that person later became a believer and god gave him a job and later on he connected with me and started supporting my ministry when i felt i i had to start my own ministry grabbing the google generation from Ghana mission one of those people who got drunk during those train journeys who has seen me cross him and give tracks to pe people you know god raised him as a supporter financial supporter for my ministry so you have no idea what God is planning and God is preparing for you, even as you get involved in ministry, even as you are a student, leave alone, have a job. So be faithful, be faithful, be fiercely faithful in the little things that God has you to do. And then those three, four years in 93 to 97, I had my ups and downs. I, there are times when I sinned against God. There were times when I backslid. Okay, but I repent and come back and God would cleanse me. But God gave me the grace to go and share the gospel. Okay, uh, again, in, in, the, uh, in, in, in Allahabad, again, using cycles, sometimes with, with friends. Sometimes I've even gone alone and given tracts. And then go to other hostels and lead Bible studies there. Lead Bible studies right in my, inside my hostel. I picked up my first theology book. Today I have a doctorate. I, I'm called doctor because I have a doctor of ministry degree. Uh, it, it took four and a half years to complete that as I studied in Southern Asia Bible College, SABC Bangalore, as it's called, the Assemblies of God Bible College for South Asia. Uh, uh, but uh, my first theology book I picked up as an engineering student. And I, what I learned about God, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of salvation you know i i wrote out notes in a diary and i taught sometimes to one person sometimes it was only richard umran in that bible study but i taught richard umran and and we prayed and uh, there were times when i went to a room called heaven that was room there was a room called heaven in my in in, in the hostel that was a room uh, where usually uh, blue films were played uh, that was a room usually where you know people would get drunk but there once uh, I remember preaching a gospel message. In those days, uh, I, I was not original in my messages. I used to read Oswald J. Smith, 
uh, a, a great writer, Oswald J. Smith, his book, uh, uh, The Salvation of God. And I preached a message, five solemn facts about salvation. To all these people, around 15, 20 people, some of them are seniors. I preached a gospel message. I, I, I you know, uh, that was, a, that was a, 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 a nearly frightening salvation message. In that room, sometimes where you know, there was used to be a bunch of students watching blue films and X-rated movies, uh, you know, a place where students, a room where students got drunk, God used me to preach his word. And outside the chemistry department, you know, gathered a few boys and I made my first presentation on what the Bible says on sex, love, marriage. Ajuki George was there and is my classmate and he was the president of Student Christian uh, SCM, Student Christian Movement. And he said, can you share the same what you shared here for the boys sitting outside chemistry department lawns in the chapel? And I said, yes. That was my first stage presentation on sex, love, marriage. And today, it's been my privilege to present the same in Dubai, present the same in, you know, in Germany, present, present the same all across India, different church denominations. I, at that time when I shared it, I never knew that God had all these plans for me. So I, want, I don't want you to forget Luke 12, 48. Okay, Luke 12, 48. Let me read that and finish this answer. Uh, Luke 12, 48. But the one who does not know, even the things deserving punishment will be, will be one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone, who, listen to this, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So if you're hearing, if, if you have this privilege of knowing Jesus at this age as a student, as a worker, you know, you have the responsibility to go out and win the lost. Okay. All right. I think I would just have time for one more answer. Okay. Let me just give one word answer. Is it... Uh, is it okay to repent every time for the same sin? Okay. Now, for a detailed answer, I would like you to read uh, my book, Straight Talk, where the last chapter where I talk, uh, I, I address this issue. Uh, will I stop sinning if I, when I, if I follow all the things that you talked about in this book? That's the last chapter of my book, Straight Talk. Okay. Is it okay to repent of the same sin? The, the thing is, it is, you can there will come a time when you repeat the same sin again and again. You would have gone so far away from God. You won't feel like asking for forgiveness. It happened to Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was, had a big problem with money. In John chapter 12, uh, John chapter 12, if you start reading, he, we, we, we see that uh, John 12, 6, Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor. John 12, 6, but be, because he was a thief, as the keeper of the money bag, he used to take from what was put in it. So Judas had this lifelong habit of pinching from Jesus' purse. So that is what ballooned up into his desire to receive money and to betray Jesus. And he went so far away from Jesus that he never felt like repenting and coming back. And in that sense, when he died, he went to hell straight. So don't take any sin lightly. Could be porn watching, could be pride, could be prayerlessness. Don't take any sin lightly. As we read in Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, when we, when we take any sin lightly and when we go back and ask for forgiveness, uh, we can. Definitely Jesus' will, blood will cleanse us, but it's like trampling on the blood of Jesus. And insulting the spirit of grace. Hebrews 10, 29. Hebrews 10 and 29. It says, how much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that has sanctified them, who has insulted the spirit of grace. So, don't treat the blood of the covenant and as, as a 
contemptuous thing and trample it underfoot. Come under the blood, blood of Jesus. Don't trample the blood of Jesus. You come under the blood of Jesus. You don't trample the blood of Jesus. Okay. Uh, and uh, the last question is not the microchip in humans resembles the mark of the beast described in Revelation 13, 16 to 18. See, I would still place it on the on the, on the, on the uh, on the on the on the horizon of speculation, because there are many interpretations about for Revelation thirteen sixteen to eighteen. The mark of the beast, for example, there are passages in the Old Testament. If you read it, I don't have time to take you. The mark did not mean a literal mark. So Revelation was written in a symbolic language. So it was only reminding people what was written in the first, the, the, the uh, first 65 books, if you, can, if you can say that. In a clear way, Revelation is only reminding people of that. If you don't take that stance on Revelation, you know, you have to say that Jesus is 50% lion, 50% lamb, because uh, we see those visions of Jesus. So is Jesus literally 50% Half he has a lion like head and lamb like legs. Is it like that? No. Jesus has characters of a lion, characters of a lamb. He's he's the king of kings who became a sacrifice for us. So the interpretation has to be symbolic. The numbers of revelation, there is, there is enough evidence to show that they are symbolic. The numbers. 1 lakh 44,000, 12 into 12 in which is a large number, thousand, a large number. So who's going to enter heaven? All the saints of the Old Testament, symbolized by 12, 12 tribes, 12 apostles. Uh, Jesus chose all the saints of the New Testament. In other words, thousand, a large number, still a remnant because we have lakhs of people, crows of people, millions of people, billions of people in the world. So of that thousand people, it's a, it's a representation of the word remnant. A minority will get saved. A remnant will get saved. So not literally thousand, a remnant, because we have billions of people living in the world. A remnant of, a remnant, uh, of, of people from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, who chose to follow the living God will come to heaven. So that's so Revelation throughout has uses a lot of fantastic imagery, but to say that this is the chip, uh, I think uh, I'm somehow not comfortable with it. Uh, does that mean if some if somebody will come to me and say directly and say that okay Duke you have to deny Jesus, okay Duke you you have to deny Jesus? I'll say. I, I won't deny Jesus, but if somebody says they want to put a chip on my on my hand, and if that it will help me in my banking technology, I have no problem taking it because the Bible that's not a problem. The Bible is talking about nowhere. The Bible says you don't take a chip. Okay, and the the only passage that talks about it, I think I believe there is enough evidence all around the passage to interpret it spiritually. the The meaning is you don't deny Jesus. Somebody asks you to deny Jesus, you don't deny Jesus. You don't compromise on the uniqueness of Jesus. Jesus is the only way. I am willing to die for it. But put whether whether to put a chip, if somebody says you put a chip uh, in your cell phone, it'll, you'll get signal. I'm doing it. In fact, I'm using a cell phone for many, many years now. If they say that if you put a chip on your hand, it's easier to use your cell phone, I don't mind using it. Okay, yes, sometimes we are scared that people will track us, but I don't, I don't care who tracks me because I, that, that's fine. I, I want to be, I, I desire to be holy inside out. So I don't care who tracks me. I don't, I, I, as long as, you know, you don't reach out to my bank and steal money from my bank. See, if it's a convenience, I don't mind putting a chip into my body. But what I will not do is deny Jesus Christ. That is more important. What I will not do is compromise in the uniqueness of Jesus. So those are things the Bible is clear about. John 14, 6, Acts 4, 12. So, so I think these are distractions about the chip and this and that. These are speculations. Let's stick on to what the Bible tells us clearly black and white. And let's, these speculations, these things which are not clear, we will understand on the final day of judgment when we when we cross over to the other, other side of eternity, Jesus will tell us all these things. All right. 
So that will be my brief response. Okay, I think we need to close. And uh, before I close, uh, there are some people who still, there are 11 participants actually. So if you can just unmute yourself and tell us from where you're watching us from and turn on your video, that'll be great. And I, I, I will pray and close. Okay, I know some of you want to be anonymous, but okay. Johnson, uh, hi Johnson. Yeah, watching us, welcome. Uh, praise the Lord, Pastor. Praise the Lord. Watching uh, us thank you. No, Pune? I know I'm from Pune. Pune, yeah. Pune, okay. So happy to have you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Pastor, okay. but I would like to discuss in that on few questions, huh? Okay, okay. Sometime now, later. <laughs> uh, 10, 17, uh, uh, I, you might hold a different opinion, but uh, uh, actually, uh, maybe on a private chat with me, you could. Uh, or uh, if you want me to join for any one of your Zoom meetings, I, uh, I would try to make a schedule to join that where, where you lead and I'm ready to listen. Uh, but right now, I, I promise to close at 10.15 because there are people, we, yeah. they join me at 9 and 10.15 we close. So I need to just uh, end, end that. So I understand you. Uh, I hope you understand my uh, the position yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. in. But I'm ready to listen to any other point of view. Uh, I know that uh, there are, for any answer I've given, there could be uh, 10 different opinions. So I, I respect that. And uh, though I passionately feel about my position and I know it's, uh, I, I, I say it's right and it's say biblical, I also concede the other opinions and uh, I'm willing to uh, discuss and dialogue if that will be helpful, but not right now, not right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very oh, much. You. Okay. Uh, well, uh, can you, others, can you please, I just want you to, if you can show, if you can uh, turn on your video and tell me from where you're watching, that'll be a great encouragement. Okay, we have a... Dixon from Chennai. Dixon? Nixon. From Chennai. Okay, Nixon from uh, Chennai. Welcome, uh, Nixon. Okay, happy to have you. Others, we have... Uh... Amrita, from, Amrita from Chennai, Anna. Not able uh, to turn on the video. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I understand. Thank you for joining us, Amrita. Amrita from Chennai. Welcome. Hello, Amrita. I'm from Rajasthan. Okay, wonderful. Aradhana Lisa. Okay, from Rajasthan. Happy to have you, Aradhana. Which place in Rajasthan? Um, I'm, I'm here in Dungapur. Dungapur. Yeah, okay, amazing. wonderful, wonderful. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay. Uh, are you on my WhatsApp? Uh, Uncle, my sister is. Oh, okay. Anubra. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Welcome. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we have Sister Mary. Okay. I don't see a response. Dan. Okay. Yeah. If you, if, if those of you can turn on your video, you could turn on your video. I'll just take a final screenshot. Okay. We had. Uh, Others also join. Some of them have left. Okay, so let's let's pray and let's finish. Lord, we thank you for this time that you've given us. And uh, Lord, we thank you that we could, Lord, dig into your word for some answers. And I pray that these answers will make scales fall from our eyes. And I pray these answers will, Lord, uh, will be the answers about which you spoke about. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free, O oh Master. We thank you for every person who has joined in this in, in this session. And I, I pray, Lord, that you will be with them in the journey of faith. And as they dig into scripture, I pray that you'll continue to provide for them answers uh, in their uh, for their life questions, oh Master. We thank you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We ask all this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I just want to let you know that we have, this is our latest uh, uh, literature that we have produced. It's a uh, it's an all color uh, magazine uh, with the lead article on sexual purity and a lot of exciting uh, stories uh, uh, stories of a medical doctor serving Jesus in uh, Orissa, uh, another person uh, serving Jesus in Nepal, and uh, one of story of one of our regular one of my most key ministry volunteers. So many stories with some super Bible teaching. So we can send this to you and two other magazines. Uh, if you would like to, if you have not seen it already, please reach out to me via WhatsApp and tell you how you can get it. Okay, this, uh, this magazine will touch your life. And also my book, Straight Talk, uh, uh, you've seen that. You just have to Google 
Google it and uh, uh, that book is also available. Straight Talk brings Bible teaching on sex, love, marriage, porn, phone addiction, and all these hot topics. Uh, there are, there's teaching for married people, single people, teens, uh, those in 20s, those in the 30s, those in 40s, uh, those even doing ministry among young people. The Google generation will find a lot of material which will be useful as well. So that book we can also send. All right. Thank you. And you all have a wonderful time. God bless. Okay. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.